Thank you, everybody. Welcome to the third uh, Friday for Corruption. My name is Randolph Bruno, and I'm one of the co-organizers, uh, together with uh, Elodie Durand. Elodie, please wave. Luke Andriani. Hello, hi. And Gerard. Gerard will be joining us a little bit later. And these four Fridays for Corruption has been running from the 6th of November, and uh, we are in the, in the third round of uh, out of four. And um, what I would like to do today is to give you a very quick introduction of uh, our speakers and then allow them to speak <coughs> for around 18 minutes. I will be more strict than my, my fellow friends, uh, Gerard, that is from Switzerland. And then we'll have around eight minutes for uh, discussion, okay? And then at the end of all presentation of all uh, uh, discussant, we will have the general kind of uh, participants discussion. So let me, first of all, give you an uh, introduction of the, of the day. And uh, so this is uh, uh, our kind of uh, uh, introduction of the uh, events. Uh, and we are going to cover today the consequences of corruption. And as I, I mentioned, this is a collaboration between three institutions. One is the Center for Political Economy and Institutional Studies at Burbeck. One is the Institute for International Management at Loughborough University. And one is the Center for Comparative Studies of Emerging Economies at School of Southern European Studies, UCL. Our speaker today are Andrea Tulli, Luca Berti, and Riccardo Di Medio. And Andrea will be uh, speaking for 20 minutes, 18 minutes, and then I will be discussant. Luca will be then be next, uh, and then uh, Gary <coughs> will be discussant, and Ricardo will be the last one. So without further overdue, I would like to really to, to ask now Andrea to start sharing his screen and having from now 18 minutes for his presentation. Thank you. Sure. So thanks a lot. Let me sh share the screen first. Yes. So can you all see this, the slides? Yes, great. So uh, thanks a lot for inviting me here. That's really a great pleasure for me to present what it was, my job market paper. So I, I was last year a PhD candidate from University of Warwick, and I started this year my position as assistant professor at the University of Tübingen. And uh, this, as I said, this, this, is, this was my job market paper. And that studies the overall impact of an anti-corruption measure on the behavior of public bodies, in particular on municipalities. So we know from the economic literature that these type of policies have different effects on different economic agents within the same monitor municipality. We know, for example, that they influence voters' decision, that they reduce the future level of corruption, that they improve the average quality of the politician. What is not clear yet is understanding the impact that this type of policies have on those municipalities that are not directly targeted. And in this case, in particular, I'm gonna focus on neighboring municipalities, okay? So what I'm gonna show you in this paper is that neighboring municipalities will respond to an implementation of an anti-corruption measure. And they will respond in two different ways. First, they will exploit more, less monitor margin of their activity. And second, they will also engage less in activities that are signal of potential corruption. Okay, so in particular, among all the municipal activities that you can think of, I'm gonna focus in, on the procurement activity of these municipalities, and they are Italian municipalities. And I focus on the procurement activity because that's a sector that among the municipalities activity is particularly vulnerable to corruption. In particular, on the type of corruption that I'm gonna use in this study, because the anti-corruption measure that I'm going to exploit is the implementation of a policy meant to limit the influence of organized crime into the municipality activity. That is the dissolution of a municipal government for infiltration by organized crime. So at the end of the day, this paper is an event study in which I'm gonna compare the change in the behavior of all those municipalities that are neighboring to a municipality that has been dissolved, to the same change in the behavior or to those municipalities that in that year are not neighboring to a municipality that has been dissolved. And of course, procurement process is a complicated process and I could focus on different outcomes related to procurement. I'm gonna focus in particular on two specific outcomes that are relevant 
when we talk about rent seeking behaviors like corruption in these sectors. The first one is the number of procurement contract issue around the relevant threshold for the Italian procurement law, that is the 40,000 euro threshold. So um, essentially, um, monitoring procurement contracts likely smaller than the threshold is much more complicated for the Italian law enforcement body than it is for procurement contracts slightly larger than this threshold. And that's because these contracts are much less transparent and the municipality has a higher discretion in the choice of the winner. Okay, so unfortunately, in the sake of time, I'm not going to describe in detail what is changing really in the law at this threshold, but trust me, that's like, I'm going to show you in the next slide that that's like a really, very relevant threshold related to the Italian procurement law. And then the second outcome that I'm going to focus on instead is the renegotiation of contracts for public works. So again, for those of you that are not familiar with the procurement setting, I'm going to discuss what a renegotiation is. Uh, like later on in this presentation, but you should consider this essentially an awarding of additional resources from the municipality to the winner firm that is actually executing the contract. And this is considered from the Italian monitoring authority and from the Italian law enforcement body, like a frequent use of the renegotiation is considered as a signal of potential corruption. Okay, so to give you a preview of the findings, I'll show you that during the dissolution of a municipal government for infiltration of organized crime, neighboring municipalities will respond to, the, to this dissolution. And in particular, they will respond in two ways. They will first shift procurement contract from above to below the 40,000 euro threshold. And I will show you that the way in which this works in practice is that these municipalities will take large projects, larger than 40,000, and split it in multiple smaller contracts, each of them smaller than the threshold. So that the overall size of the project doesn't change, but each of these contracts being smaller than the threshold will be more complicated to monitor for the law enforcement body. And then as additional evidence related to these results, I will also show you that this response is coming exclusively from those sectors in which organized crime is more likely to infiltrate. That are not surprisingly waste management and the construction works. Then I will focus also on the renegotiation, as I said before, and I will show you that after the implementation of this solution, neighboring municipalities will issue fewer and smaller renegotiation contracts. So these two results are consistent with the hypothesis that neighboring municipalities respond to the implementation of an anti-corruption measure, in particular exploiting more, less monitor margin of their procurement activity, and at the same time engaging less in activities that are signal of potential irregularities, like indeed corruption. So, before showing you the estimation strategy more in detail, let me give you like a snapshot of the entire data set that I'm gonna use at this stage. That is essentially the universe of the procurement contract issued by these Italian municipalities, okay? Um, so this is the distribution of the procurement contract in my data that again is the universe of the procurement contract issued by these municipalities from 2011 to 2016. And there's a distribution based on the face value. So as you can see, there is a very big bunch around the, what is the dashed line that is exactly the 40,000 euro threshold. That is actually 10 times more likely to issue a procurement slightly smaller than 40,000 than slightly larger than that. And of course, I'm not claiming that all of these bunches due to corruption. There might be different reasons of why municipalities might want to issue a procurement slightly smaller than 40,000. But in my paper, I'm going to observe the change in the behavior around this threshold during the implementation of an anti-corruption measure in a neighboring municipality. So the way in which I do it in practice is that I take all the procurement issued by these municipalities in every year and I split them in bins of 5,000 each. So the unit of observation is the inverse hyperbolic sign of the number of procurement contract issued in that bin on that municipality in that year. And I will regress this on bin fixed effect, municipality fixed effect, year fixed effect. And then we are interested about understanding the average effect of the dissolution on the number of procurement issued by this municipality. And that's exactly what the treatment dummy is about. That is a dummy taking value one during the dissolution, zero otherwise. But since the dissolution is a policy that lasts three years, essentially, and I have data from 2011 to 2016, I can also observe what happened after the dissolution of, this, the, of the neighboring municipality. And that's what the after-treatment variable is about. Now, the real object of the analysis, though, 
is checking whether these policies have differential effect on the number of procurement contracts issued right below the 40,000 compared to all the other. And that's why I additionally interact the treatment and after treatment variable for all those beans that are between 25,000 and 40,000. Then I have municipalities control, average neighboring control, province in a trend, and Conley standard error to account for special correlation. Okay, so now since this is an event study, what I'm going to show you in the next slide is essentially the differential effect of the number of beans issued right below the 40,000 for all the years before, during, and after the dissolution. Okay. So that's what the graph is about. And you see that there is actually no effect on the number of procurement countries should ride below the 40,000 for before the dissolution, while there is an increasing during and after the dissolution. Okay, so now to give you a little bit more of evidence of what is, of what is going on at this threshold, I show you the two additional results that I have related to the 40,000 euro. And the first one is really related to the mechanism of how municipalities in practice shift procurement contract from above to below the 40,000 euro. So that can be done in different ways. The first thing that, the first way that you can think of is that municipalities can take large project, larger than 40,000, and reducing the size of this project is making it smaller than the threshold. That would probably have some impact on real variables, like for example, the quality of the group. An alternative instead, is taking the same project, larger than 40,000, and split it in multiple contracts, each of them smaller than the threshold, so that the overall size of the project doesn't change, but each of these contracts being smaller than the threshold will be more complicated to monitor for the law enforcement body. Now, this practice, let me be clear, is supposed to be an illegal practice. Municipalities shouldn't be able to split the same project in multiple contracts to avoid the procurement law. That's not what it, they should be, do, should be doing. But in practice, verifying for the law enforcement body that two contracts belong to the very same project is something extremely complicated. And so in practice, this is something that is not really monitored by the law enforcement body. So how do I do it? The way in which I identify project, contracts that belong to the same project is essentially uh, comparing the description of the contract issued by the same municipality in the same year. The description of, of the, uh, the contract smaller than the 40,000. And I will compare the description of the contract using two different techniques. One is approximate string matching. That is essentially a naive way of doing the number of changes that you need to make one description identical to the other. And the other one is text analysis, in particular word embedding. Okay? That has instead a little bit of more com uh, complicated computation. So this analysis will be an analysis on municipality year level, in which we will have municipality, uh, the, the outcome variable will be the expenditure on split project, on municipality, year fixed effect, and all the rest is absolutely the same. Treatment, after treatment, control, average neighboring control, and so on. So let me show you the result. Um, the results, as you see, that no matter the type of methodology that I use to identify split projects, there is an increasing in the expenditure of split projects both during and after the dissolution of a neighboring municipality. Okay? So now um, I will focus on the second set of evidence related to this result. That is instead about what are the sectors that, are, that respond more to the dissolution of a neighboring and in order to do this, I need first to understand what are really the sectors that are more vulnerable to the infiltration of organized crime. And the way in which I do it in this case is really analytically going to check on the report of all the dissolution made by the, during the period of analysis. So the law enforcement bodies after the dissolution publish a very detailed report of what are the reasons that justify this dissolution. And from there, I gather what are the information on the sectors in which organized crime infiltrate. And in 75% of these cases, organized crime infiltrated in two sectors only, waste management and construction. So now I would like to therefore see whether the response is coming mainly from these two sectors or from all the other. And the way to do it is, if, unfortunately, I don't have information on the number of procurement contracts 
on the on the sector of the procurement contract below the threshold. I have it only for the one above. So I'm going to show you the number of procurement contracts that are disappearing from above the threshold instead of bunching below. So the regression will be the same. The outcome variable is going to be the number of procurement contracts either on the waste management and construction or on all the rest. And that's what you see here, where well, you see that the reduction is coming exclusively from those sectors in which organized crime is more likely to infiltrate, that is construction and waste management. Now, very quickly, since I'm running out of time, let me talk about the results on the renegotiation, in which, and briefly, what a renegotiation is about. A renegotiation is essentially additional resources that municipalities can award during the public work during the execution of the public work to the winner firm if the winner firm faces an unexpected obstacle during the completion of the, the object of the contract. Now, the nice feature of the renegotiation, the, actually the... I think I am being... No? Okay. Um, the nice feature of this renegotiation is that there is no need for any awarding procedure. So the municipality award these additional resources for free. Okay? And that's why it's particularly risky for corruption. It's considered a signal of potential corruption. So this analysis is going to be at control level to exploit the information on the good that I have. And therefore, I have good fixed affair, municipality fixed affair, year fixed affair, and all the rest. And I'm going to regress it on different outcomes related to renegotiations. And as you can see, there is a decreasing in the probability in the first column to have a renegotiation, and there is also a substantial decreasing in the sizes of this renegotiation. While at the same time, there is not a distribution of resources in other phases of the project, because those projects that don't have a negotiation, they don't see any increase in the value of the project during the, and after the dissolution. So to conclude, I hopefully convince you that the dissolution of a municipal government generates two different effects on the behavior of neighboring municipalities. They issue smaller contracts, and at the same time, they issue fewer and smaller negotiations. So these results are consistent with the hypothesis that neighboring municipalities respond to the dissolution of a municipal government. And in particular, they respond exploiting more, less monitored margin of their procurement activity and engaging less in activities that are signal of potential corruption. So in a sense, the takeaway of this paper is that policymakers should be particularly careful in studying the incentive and the exact incentive that are behind the implementation of each policy because there might be some unexpected response also coming from public bodies that were not really object of the measure. So that's all that I have for today, and thanks a lot for the opportunity, and I'm very happy to answer to any questions that you might have. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Andrea. This is extremely interesting, and uh, you are perfectly on time. So um, I'm going to actually uh, straight away share my screen to comment this uh, very very, very interesting uh, paper. So, let me go to full screen. Can you see my screen? No, yet, but because I should stop sharing. Yes. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Okay. I think yes. 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 Thank you, Luca. Okay. So, um, um, the, I, will, I will go to the uh, the paper in two slides. So it's kind of uh, trying to. It's kind of a heroic uh, uh, attempt. I will, I'll try to summarize the whole paper in two slides. I will have a general comments on, uh, on what I think about the paper, some suggestions, some really minor points, and then I will conclude. So this is a 59 paper, <laughs> 59 page paper, and it's a, extremely rich, it's extremely rich. And um, so I'll try to summarize it uh, in two slides. So this paper looks at Italian public procurement data uh, in, a, in a specific span, span of time on dissolution of local municipalities by the ANAC, the National Anti-Corruption Authority. So that's the database used, okay? What's the, what's the technique? The state is defensive, okay? It's plotting what? The spatial and temporary heterogeneity of unexpected loan form. So that's, that's the idea. So try to use these uh, kind of uh, interruption of a, of, a, of a junta or of a, of a municipality that is not expected. Okay, and uh, and how these unexpected events might change the behavior of whom, of neighboring municipalities. Okay, neighboring municipalities might might change the behavior on two things. One is the in the in the way they organize their contracts, 
and two in the way they're negotiated, okay? So, and what is suggested in the paper that there is a specific channel transmission, okay, of stuff spillover. So they basically, the neighboring uh, municipality hide illegal activities by splitting the contracts, okay? And then otherwise they calling value. And this reduces the probability that next ANAC will target them. So they basically are looking forward and trying, okay, if I don't want to be the next one to, to be uh, dissoluted, I should do something and, don't, and then I have to hide under the rug, as the, as the title said. So what's the paper finds? A lot of things, but I think the two main results are the following, okay? The paper finds a significant and economically relevant effect. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's quite interesting. It's not only about being statistically significant. Some, some, sometimes we see papers that are extremely statistically significant, but when you look at, at the economic side, it's really, really not much. But actually, the paper finds quite significant effect. So the number of contracts in the main results, there are many, many kind of different type of results, but the number of contracts below the threshold increases on average 20% during the neighboring dissolution and 26% afterwards, okay? And I think this is a less interesting result because economically it's less, less important, but it's still significant as some, some sense, the probability of a negotiation the contract during an neighboring dissolution decreases of 4%. And there are a wide range of uh, robustness checks, sensitivity. Uh, basically, while I was reading the paper, I say, oh, but this needs a robust check. It was there. Ah, oh, but needs, oh, but this has to be checked. It was there. So it's, it's incredibly, incredibly thorough, thorough paper. Okay. General comment. Well, the paper is extremely relevant. So it's uh, it's both within the corruption study literature, and that's why we are in for, uh, for uh, Friday for Corruption, but also in the public procurement, public economics literature in general. It's extremely relevant paper. It's done in Italy that is a perfect laboratory for that. Uh, uh, as you probably have noticed, it's completely by chance that the three speakers today are Italians. The two uh, moderators, me and Luca, are Italians, and this is completely by chance. But we all work outside Italy. <laughs> so that's, that's something that you, you might think about, okay? It's a perfect laboratory because it's still a highly corrupt country by international standards. Even if in high income countries, it's still a very high corrupt. How? The political is very thorough and, and the paper is very high potential. I think it's really, really a paper that could fly, fly very well. And why? Because we need more evidence-based study like this to give precise indication to policymakers. We, we hear a lot about corruption in the discourse of politicians. Oh, wow, we have to tackle corruption, blah, blah, blah. but we never have kind of a sense how, when, and how, and in, in which type of policy. And this paper actually goes in that direction. So it's extremely, extremely welcome. Okay, so my suggestion, okay. The identification strategy lays upon the exogeneity of the treatment. That's obviously the, the kind of uh, uh, silver bullet of the paper. Okay, I have a little bit of concern here because mafia, unfortunately, has an edge of local information. So, and even if ANAC might try to best to conceal information till last moment, Mafia can still have an edge on that. So I don't buy it completely, okay? What I'd suggest though that the idea that the arrest of public official is not a good anticipation of the solution might actually be a way to create an even more exogenous shock, like using the residual of the, the solution on a regression on arrest, because that's really what you wouldn't expect because there are not even arrests giving you that, okay? And this might actually give you an edge on the exogeneity. Second, Treatment is purely geographical treatment. And I'm, I'm not sure this is captured the complexity of the activity of mafia and corruption in Italy, where the ties are usually social and economical. And maybe the ANAC might have a network of ties that go beyond geography. It means as close geography. There might be some other kind of municipalities that are not prox proxy by geography that actually are co closely tied to, to corruption. So that's the treatment I think could be a, a little bit more elaborated, okay? I think that big cities and more municipalities should be actually look more, more in details. You have a 10, per, 10 kilometer rule and you have control for population, but I'm still not convinced that municipalities, more municipalities and big city like Naples, okay? They work in the same way. They probably work in a completely different way in trying to, uh, uh, to uh, go around this threshold, okay? So, and uh, um, there is a big back, back box. It's, it's the only sort of black box I found in the paper. When I was reading it, etc., it I was extremely interesting. Oh, this is done, this is done, this is done. Then I came across figure 13. The bulk of motivation for the solution is actually others. And we don't know anything about that. 
And we don't know if this is a potential source of other channels. So this is a really kind of a, something that we, we don't, we don't, we cannot understand from the paper. This is a, a sort of implicit assumption in the paper that there is no cost in splitting the contracts. And I, I'm not sure this is true or more justification is needed because I mean, if you have a con you have a contract of say, suppose 120 and you split in three, you still have to have this a consistency, et cetera. So I'm not sure this is a zero cost or a, 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 a tiny cost uh, operation. So we are, the paper should be more convincing on that, okay? And also the ANAC is a kind of a static, a static player. So it's not adapting at all. It's not changing the threshold. It's not sort of finding. So I, uh, this give me sort of a, a even more gloom picture. Maybe there is an even higher level of corruption. So it's sort of, in, in the paper, the ANAC is sort of there. It looks this happening uh, because it's quite clear and I'm sure ANAC knows these, 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 these things, but nothing happens. The threshold is still there. Uh, the, 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 the monetary remains the same. So this is sort of implicit assumption of static behavior of ANAC that if it's true, it's very, very, very gloom. If it's not true, it needs more, um, more consideration. And finally, policy implication. I, 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 I thank Andrea for the, the presentation. It's much better than in paper. In the paper, policy implication are two lines, and I think it's highly underdeveloped. So it needs a much more, maybe in this version of the paper. There are minor points. I have uh, uh, two minutes, so I should be done. Okay, I should be able with that. Uh, so um, there is a control for year until next election. I think uh, this is a nice control. That's that's exactly one of the things I came across when I thought, okay, but what about politics behind that? I think it's a simplified version of a much more complex political dynamics behind the scene. So you are simplifying um, maybe some movements of people, candidates, et cetera, um, under the radar in order to counteract or to pre prevent the solution. And you're using just um, here to the next election. I think it's a even oversimplification. A question four, I think there are a couple of things that be uh, better as, uh, as explained. Uh, I, I can give you my, my comment, maybe. It's there. I think it's a, it's a bit uh, uh, rushed through. You have to explain it much more because it's, it's a very complicated equation and it's still rushed. Uh, the postal regression, uh, on the background level of computation, they give me a 29% uh, uh, results that is much higher than the OLS. Which one should we believe? So which one should we be uh, taking? So uh, uh, this the paper is a bit agnostic on the, on, the, on the quantity. Sometimes I say, oh, is this amount is that amount? I think it should be more precise. And I haven't seen, I'm running out of my time, I haven't seen a robustness check on the proportion of contracts below the 40K threshold on a support around the treasure. I've seen everything. I've seen the value. I've seen the number of contracts. I've seen some uh, checking on the sensitivity. I, I haven't seen the proportion of contracts. So how many contracts in proportion around the, uh, the 40 are actually increased? So that would be uh, uh, interesting to know. Again, about anti-corruption policies that are not related to solution. That's, but that's sort of a, an extra paragraph. I, I don't think the paper. So concluding. It's a very, uh, it's a very high impact paper. I, I think it, it should fly uh, after the Galette 2017. And it's a, it's a gloom paper in a sense, because uh, as we know, the North-South divide in Italy has been historically determined in the 19th century, but we are seeing the consequences of that after 150 years. So it's kind of, it reminds me of my, my own country, it's how, how difficult it is to, to solve this problem. So, yeah, that was my comments. I, I, Andrea, hold your breath because we, we, we need to go to, to the next. Okay, Luca and Alberti. Thanks, Anna. Okay, Luca Alberti uh, is the next presenter and uh, we go for 18 minutes from here. Thank you, Luca. All right, um, good afternoon, everyone. Can you, can you hear me and see the screen? Yes, All right, yes. super, super fantastic. Okay, so I think that actually my paper is a nice follow on from, from the previous one, which examined the consequences of an anti-corruption intervention. What I do in this paper, on the other hand, is to examine the consequences of corruption uh, on macroeconomic uh, performance. And obviously one of the main rationales for fighting corruption and devoting resources to anti-corruption efforts is that corruption is harmful for economic uh, uh, development and growth. And the purpose of this paper is to, is to examine um, uh, this, um, uh, this assumption. Obviously, this is by far not the first paper that tackles this question, but the main innovation uh, of, of this paper is that it exploits 
long run time series variation uh, on uh, corruption levels within countries to identify its effects on economic growth. And it is able to do so uh, thanks to a newly available data set, the Varieties of Democracy data set, which provides a new and arguably improved perception-based indicator of corruption, which extends all the way back to the French Revolution, in fact, for, uh, uh, for some countries. So encompassing the whole of modern history, essentially. Um, so just let me say a couple of things about um, what the main theories are about the relationship between corruption and aggregate economic growth. So the theorists are primarily divided in two camps. So there are some people that argue, and this is by far the majority of economists that argue um, that corruption exerts a sand the wheels effect on economic growth. Yeah? So it, 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 it slows um, economic growth essentially by lowering investment. It has a chilling effect of investment. It reduces the private marginal product of capital. So in a way it acts as, a, as an additional hidden tax on investment. But it also leads to less efficient investment choices. Yeah? And in addition, some authors argue that it even misallocates talent. So in countries with a high level of corruption, talented, skilled individuals have an incentive to embark on rent seeking rather than entrepreneurship activities. Yeah? So it both lowers investment and, uh, um, and efficiency, thereby reducing economic growth. But there are other economists, actually, that argue that corruption under some circumstances may actually have the effect of greasing the wheels of a dysfunctional institutional framework and thereby promote economic growth. And you can distinguish at least four channels by which corruption may compensate for institutional deficiencies and help countries achieve higher levels of, um, of uh, uh, steady state economic growth. Well, first of all, um, Corruptions and bribes may compensate for low bureaucratic efficiency or capacity. Yeah? So if a bureaucracy is inefficient, incapable, slow, firms, bribe paying, bribe paying firms may actually speed up bureaucratic decisions and processes. Corruption, second, can also act as a hedge against bad policies. So if the government is biased against markets and entrepreneurship, for instance, maybe for ideological reasons, bribe paying firms may be able to bypass or circumvent inefficient market unfriendly regulations. More recently, some authors, and I'm, here I'm referring primarily to the work of uh, Mushtaq Khan, have argued that corruption can provide second best uh, solutions to coordination problems, such as the protection of property rights. So in countries with a very weak rule of law, without a universal system of property rights protections, asset owners, and uh, capitalists can um, uh, uh, protect their property rights and stave off expropriations by essentially paying bribes and political contributions um, uh, to politicians. Lastly, some authors have argued that corruption may be less, than uh, uh, less detrimental in autocracies. And this argument really goes back to the uh, very influential work of Schleifer and Vishni, who have shown in a formal model, or what, well, semi-formal model, that um, more centralized forms of corruption can be less detrimental to economic performance than more decentralized competitive forms of, of corruption. And on the assumption that corruption may be more centralized in autocracies relative to democracies running competitive elections, the prediction here is that the effect of corruption on economic performance should be at least less, that, um, less damaging, if not growth enhancing in autocracies. So the grease the wheels hypothesis actually leads to these testable predictions. So when background institutions are good, well-functioning and so on, corruption should reduce uh, the steady state rate of economic growth. But where institutions are dysfunctional, yeah, so where there is low state capacity, um, bad policies, low protection of property rights and low levels of democracy, corruption may enhance growth, or at best, it may have no effect on, on economic performance. Um, so there is an extensive empirical literature on these, um, uh, testing these propositions, but it's easy to identify three main shortcomings on this literature, and, and my paper kind of takes its motivation uh, uh, in these three shortcomings. 
So first of all, the bulk of the literature relies primarily on cross-sectional regressions. So obviously the estimates could be subject to omitted variable bias. And you can think of all manner of country specific time invariant characteristics, such as for instance, culture, trust levels, history, and so on, which are very difficult to measure, but may influence both corruption levels and aggregate economic performance. So more recently, a small number of studies have, empl have, have employed panel data sets to test the causal effect of corruption on economic performance, but they all rely on, sh on very, very short panels. So for instance, the latest paper by Gründler and, Gründler and Potrafke uh, only relies on a panel with seven years. Yeah? And the problem obviously with this panel uh, data regressions is that it's very, doubtful whether time variation in corruption indicators over such a short period of time reflects just white noise or it reflects actual changes in the incidence of corruption on the ground. Corruption is slow moving, corruption perceptions are also slow moving because obviously experts and, and citizens uh, have a hard time sometimes tracking the evolution of corruption over time. There are delay effects and so on. So it's, 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 uh, it's not clear whether we can use short run variation in these corruption indicators to identify a meaningful effect of corruption on economic performance. Thirdly, the grease the wheels hypothesis itself has never been tested in a panel data framework. So in this paper, I try to ad address these three main shortcomings and I estimate uh, a panel data regression using the VDEM measure of corruption, which as I said, offers the best coverage over time of all existing uh, indicators of corruption. So just a quick preview of the results. What I find is that corruption exerts a negative effect on the steady state rate of economic growth. And cautiously, I interpret this partial correlation as, um, as representing a causal effect. And I also find some evidence in support of what I describe as a weak form of the grease the wheels um, uh, hypothesis. So the VDEM data set. So this is an expert coded perception based uh, set of indicators that measure various aspects of democratic quality around the world, covering all polities or most polities around the world, including historical polities such as Baden-Württemberg or uh, 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 the kingdom of uh, uh, Sardinia, uh, for instance, um, over a period of 200 years, starting with the French Revolution. And I focus in particular on the V2X score indicator, which measures the extent to which political corruption is pervasive, tapping into several distinct types of corruption, both petty and grand, both bribery and theft, both corruption aimed at influencing lawmaking and that affecting implementation. So just to give you a quick snapshot of how this, this indicator is arrived at. So each data point is coded by at least five uh, um, recognized experts on a certain country. Uh, and the experts provide responses, uh, well, ordinal responses on typically a five, um, five category uh, uh, response, um, a response sheet, and each category comes with a fairly detailed rubric. And then uh, these ordinal scores are aggregated and, uh, and uh, uh, manipulated using an item response theory model based on Bayesian theory which produces a continuous indicator, which is normally distributed. And then these continuous indicators can be uh, aggregated. So in particular, the political corruption index that I use in the analysis is arrived at uh, by taking an unweighted average of four indicators that measure uh, corruption in different, um, uh, in different regions of the state. Yeah, so corruption in the bureaucracy, in the executive branch of government, in, in parliaments, and in the judiciary. So as you can see, so this is just for illustrative purposes. Uh, so this plots the uh, VDEM corruption indicator over time for four countries. And as you can see, there is substantial, albeit slow moving, long run variation within countries over time. Yeah, And I exploit this slow moving, long run variation within countries to identify the effect uh, of interest. Obviously there are pros and cons with the VDEM indicator vis-a-vis -vis existing uh, and widely used measured such as Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index. This is an expert coded indicator rather than a poll of polls. It's coded retroactively rather than being produced year by year. 
Even so, it is arguably more fine-grained because it's based on, it's constructed hierarchically from lower level, sort of very precisely worded indicators. And obviously its, its coverage is significantly improved, I mean, dramatically improved relative to existing indicators. Good news is that it is very highly correlated at 0.9, in fact, with both Transparency International CPI and with the World Bank's Control of Corruption Index, which are widely used in the, in the literature. So to measure background institutions that are supposed to interact with corruption, according to the Grease the Wheels hypothesis, I focus on four um, indicators, again, from the VDEM uh, data set. One is a measure of state capacity, which, met, which is an average of two VDEM measures, one on meritocratic appointment and promotion in the state administration, and the other one on um, on, impartial, um, on impartial bureaucracy. Then I have a measure of regulatory quality, which I proxy using the um, degree of state ownership of the economy. I have a measure of property rights protection and a measure of the quality of democracy. You have five minutes. You have five minutes. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, so the empirical specification, I estimate a panel data growth regression with uh, the growth rate of GDP per capita uh, on the left-hand side, this is a um, uh, panel split up in uh, five-year intervals, and I regress that on corruption as measured at the beginning of each five-year period, the log of GDP per capita at the beginning of each five-year period to measure convergence dynamics, which I also allow to be non-linear, um, um, country fixed effects, time period fixed effects, and then a number of time-varying control variables. So just a quick snapshot of the results, which are very preliminary. So as you can see, uh, corruption uh, exerts a negative um, effect on the steady state rate of GDP per capita growth, even after controlling for uh, faced effect, for, um, sorry, for country fixed effects, and after allowing the convergence out of steady state dynamics to be non-linear. Um, uh, we obtain similar results if we also add three lags of growth, as suggested in a recent paper by Ajamalu and, and colleagues. And uh, the results are qualitatively unchanged if we add a number of time-varying control variables to measure the rate of population growth, a proxy for human capital, and a proxy for political stability. And the result is also robust to including um, the, back, the, the measure of background institutional quality. Next, to test the Grease the Wheels hypothesis, I allow the coefficient um, on the, um, the effect of corruption on economic growth to vary according to the quality of background institutions. And I do that by including interaction terms, uh, multiplicative interaction terms between corruption and the other institutional quality uh, indicators. And what I find in line with the Grease the Wheels hypothesis is that the effects of corruption on growth are quite highly heterogeneous. So institutional quality, background, so the quality of background institutions exerts a moderating influence on the effect of corruption on growth. And in particular, uh, higher quality institutions, so when institutions are higher quality, the effect of corruption is more negative. You know? So corruption is more harmful for economic performance. The institutional dimension that exerts the most uh, um, uh, significant and larger moderating influence is the quality of democracy. So in autocracies, the effect of corruption on growth is null, whereas it is highly negative and highly significant uh, in democracy. So to conclude, I, uh, so the main innovation of this paper is that it exploits long run, slow moving variation within countries over time in, uh, per se in a new perception based indicator of corruption to identify the effects of corruption on growth. Corruption is on average growth reducing, but there are substantial heterogeneities that vary according to the quality of institutions in the background. And I find support for a weak form of the Grease the Wheels hypothesis in the sense that corruption, although background institutions moderate the uh, effects of corruption on economic growth, they, nev they never make um, that effect positive however bad background institutions are. Yeah. So it's in that sense, uh, uh, this may be considered to be a weak form of the, of the Grease the Wheels hypothesis. So the main policy implication that these results are 
preliminarily pointing at is that anti-corruption efforts and resources should be better targeted to those countries and contexts where corruption is most harmful for economic growth and development. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luca. Perfect timing, very interesting paper. Um, uh, and uh, I will just give the, the, the floor to Gay Gizitz uh, for his discussion. So the floor is yours. I can, everyone can hear, I think, yeah? Luca, yeah, you have to take out your, and then- okay, Thank you. Uh, my, yeah. Okay, my name is Guy Gizitz Ashirov. So uh, I read this paper, it was very good uh, from Luca. So technically the paper too is, uh, it revisits this uh, corruption growth link, nexus and analysis. Uh, this based on new historical data, yeah. So, so it's, it's quite interesting in many aspects, but main novelty I think in this paper is coming from methodological and data related thing because it, it, it uh, targets these shortcomings of uh, previous papers, but mainly their uh, methodological limitations. So what is what is saying as a uh, as a result? So corruption is harmful to economic growth of countries which have uh, strong institutions, but it's mostly unrelated to economic performance in countries displaying institutional dysfunctions on each of these four dimensions. So it's somehow uh, in in line with the Grisa wheel effect uh, hypothesis. So overall, it is like this. And uh, the, I have some comments and uh, suggestions about this paper. Usually when, when some paper revisits um, the previously, previously investigated relationships, like, uh, like here, corruption growth link, I expect kind of uh, uh, um, something, something very uh, new. So, instead of uh, targeting only methodological shortcoming, which is very, which are very important, I was expecting more uh, um, theoretical contribution or some kind of different, uh, uh, different mechanism behind. So my humble opinion would be in that aspect is uh, instead of direct looking relationship between corruption and growth, perhaps it will be much more interesting to study corruption and how it influences the possible mechanisms. He already mentioned in the slides and paper as well, the possible mechanisms, but uh, uh, but it could be much more different if, for example, uh, he looked this, uh, looking more deeply in uh, one mechanism, let's say investment and the resource allocation and uh, the tax, bribery as a tax or the capital formation and telling us that, uh, uh, okay, this uh, from resource allocation side, it could be positive. It could be positively affecting on it, but it could uh, it could be difficult. Uh, it it could be negatively affecting on investment. So kind of I was expecting to hear like uh, some kind of uh, oh that's surprising and unexpected results. Yeah, that could actually a uh, game changer in studying corruption and growth link. So. Uh, Maybe sadly, maybe not, but uh, I was expecting very unexpected results that uh, actually receive much more attention. For example, again, I'm repeating myself, like corruption doesn't lower uh, investment, but it creates inefficient, uh, inefficient allocation. And then uh, through this, it affects, uh, it affects economic growth in a positive way or a negative. This was, uh, I was much more expecting, but uh, it was uh, limited by more uh, uh, use of uh, historical data. And if you actually look to the paper, the, the data part is a bit uh, dominating in the paper. And uh, about the, now we are returning to the uh, data. Uh, so uh, when I see some historical um, data, this kind of long and big, uh, which is good, but at the same time, I am also uh, approaching it uh, with a great care, yeah, cautiously. So uh, two issues could uh, raise out of it is uh, one, uh, one possible is uh, perception of corruption has been evolving historically. It's not the same 100 years ago or 50 years ago and uh, it, right now and it will not be the same in the future. So uh, uh, perhaps it wasn't much important 
than saline tissue before and now it's um, I don't know how how um, how good to analyze very far long distance this kind of um, relationship it is still a question but on the other hand is a time and geographical division I saw in uh, robustness checks I think uh, that uh, time wise author divided to three periods but uh, in near history we had uh, much more dramatic changes in history for example collapse of Berlin Wall or Second World War or, or uh, Soviet Union and liberation of colonies but still there are 164 countries on uh, regression so still kind of not uh, I, I'm not sure how robust it is for this but uh, yeah breakdowns much more further breakdowns should be I think done and made analysis based on this. So three, uh, three um, these time-wise breakdowns. It doesn't actually this um, cover the Soviet Union uh, collapse, for example, because it really made huge changes on uh, institutional uh, quality of these countries before Soviet, after Soviet, and even for some countries, uh, this uh, before EU, after EU thing was a very uh, important factor for their uh, institutional development in the, in the way. So uh, I think Luca might look uh, on this uh, much more uh, better uh, in the future. And uh, one more thing I think I usually mention because I have, uh, I have um, written on this. So uh, public corruption, I think in the historically, Public corruption wasn't the most uh, dominating one, I think, in the uh, in this analysis. So economic growth and the uh, role of private sector, and uh, we cannot really ignore private corruption. So I'm not sure how how good is very whether it's providing this kind of data set uh, data this current data set, but I think role of private corruption in economic growth could be much more interesting. I think. And uh, one more thing about the results, that uh, it, it tells corruption is harmful to economic growth, which have a strong institutions. And uh, this has been interesting for me as well, that uh, what about these uh, money laundering cases in a countries like Scandinavian countries, which have very strong institutions in that aspect, but uh, we don't really see a kind of a negative uh, consequences on economic growth. I have been very interested on this and I, I, I want to know actually the opinion, opinion of him. So uh, with the, the corruption we are looking as a corruption experts, they are a bit more petty corruption or uh, political, but we don't really cover much more bigger size because uh, this Transparency International once published that uh, actual size wise, the corruption in developed countries is much more bigger than underdeveloped or developing countries. So still uh, the story, the current story is not really uh, matching with, uh, with the realities of life. This is uh, my uh, opinion. And uh, one more thing from, uh, from uh, uh, analysis, this reports, this state capacity has a negative effect in the results. I just wondered this personal uh, curiosity, how, how he would explain this result, uh, this state capacity has a negative and stati statistically significant effect on uh, uh, GDP per capita growth would be nice. And uh, these are my whole uh, comments. Uh, thank you very much. And it was uh, nice to read. And I, I would like to read this paper when it's full and with a much more uh, uh, longer time period, I have to say, uh, Luca here, I got this paper at one and a half day ago, so uh, all my comments based on this. So uh, I want to read more of this paper because it is really interesting and I would like to read uh, in a more developed uh, level. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gizit. Uh, thank you for these uh, insightful comments. Uh, we are doing perfect on time. So I would like to ask now Ricardo Di Medio to start sharing his screen and to present. You have 18 minutes. Thank you. Sure, thank you very much. Let's see. Can you hear me? Um, let's see. Sorry, I'm having a bit of technical issues. There we go. Um, right. So 
Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Ricardo Numidio, and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Sussex, uh, the Center for the Study of Corruption. And this paper is largely based on my PhD dissertation, uh, so you'll have to forgive me if um, the slides are a little packed. But what I would like to do in the next um, 20 minutes uh, or um, 18 minutes is to go through very briefly through some of the theoretical approaches to corruption and position social norms theory within those. And then I will go through the research question, the analytical framework and the research design and methods underpinning the paper. And then uh, we can take a deep dive into the Ghana police service and the constellation of social norms that surround cor uh, corrupt behavior in the service and then uh, discuss some of the um, implications um, or reflections um, to, to conclude. Now, corruption has um, traditionally been conceptualized as a principal agent problem. And this body of literature really explores why is there corruption? Now, criticism to this approach uh, has emerged. Some scholars are doing that in context of endemic corruption. Um, corruption actually re resembles more a collective action problem. And this area of work uh, really explores the question, why do anti-corruption interventions fail? Now, a third body of literature can be um, clustered into the new institutional approach that has focused on exploring how institutions shape corruption and how corruption itself becomes institutionalized. And finally, there is a, a fourth body of knowledge, which is really about, um, and that emerges out of anthropology, which highlights a whole set of logics or norms that are embedded in specific cultures. Now, in different ways and to different extents, uh, these ways of conceptualizing corruption have underpinned a range of institutional reforms in both the north and the south of the world. However, today, many scholars and practitioners would argue that anti-corruption efforts represent a huge policy failure. And this lack of evidence of successful reforms and interventions has prompted, in the past few years, a range of scholars to call for a rethink of corruption, um, deepening the understanding of the phenomena and shifting from a one-size-fits-all or what Hayward called the hocus-pocus to a more nuanced understanding of corruption. So in an effort to contribute to this debate, I would like to present a set of, nor a set of notions or a set of tools that emerge from social psychology and primarily social norms. Now, Bicchieri defines social norms as the grammar of social interaction. And these essentially are behavioral rules that are shared by people in a given society or group. They define what is considered normal and what is appropriate for that specific group. Now, um, some scholars identify four critical defining features of social norms or four key kind of building blocks. Um, we have descriptive norms, and this is what people think others do. So, you know, for example, in the UK, a descriptive norm could be queuing. Everybody queues in the UK. It's normal to queue. A second building blocks are injunctive norms. And this is what people think others approve or disapprove of. So again, following the same example, in the UK, um, an injunctive norm is that people should queue. In general, in the UK, people approve of queuing. A third building block are sanctions, and these can be positive or negative. Now, I don't know if you ever tried jumping a queue in the UK, but that should give you an idea of what a, a negative sanction is. And the fourth building block is the reference group. And these, the reference group is basically those people whose expectations regarding a particular behavior are important. So in the case of queuing, um, the reference group would be the people standing in a line and, um, and, and queuing. Now, obviously, social norms are one among many determinants of behavior, and um, Chislagi and Heist divide the different determinants of behavior in four different domains. So we have the structural domain, which contains, you know, the laws, the criminal justice system, the economic policies, and so on. The material domain, which includes um, availability and access to services, to assets, to infrastructure. The social domain, which includes um, social networks, um, support networks, and so on, and the individual domain, which includes um, skills, factual beliefs, attitudes, and, um, and so on. Now, social norms really exist between, at the intersection between the individual and the social norm, uh, the, so, the individual and the social domain, sorry. 
And the role and impact that these kind of norms have on behavior in terms of corruption and integrity really lie at the core of my research interests. And um, in fact, in this paper, the kind of questions I tried to address was what social norms are relevant for corrupt behavior in the Ghana police service? What form do they take? And how and under what set of circumstances do they act for the determinants of corrupt behavior? Now, the analytical framework that I use uh, draws on the work of Chislagi and Heist that suggests that normative influence over a given um, uh, practice depends on the interaction of four different factors. Um, dependent, so whether a practice is independent, dependent, and um, interdependent. Um, detectability, so whether a practice is detectable or not. And proximity. And here by proximity, I mean uh, whether there is direct or indirect normative influence. By direct normative influence, uh, I mean uh, an almost kind of complete overlap between the norm and the behavior. So for example, the example I gave before about queuing, the norm of you should queue or everybody queues and the practice of queuing are basically the same. They're completely overlapping. Indirect normative influence foresees a range of different norms that feed into a specific behavior. So for example, gender-based violence, for example, as a practice, can be encouraged by a range of social norms, such as norms of masculinity, of privacy, um, and so on. And the fourth kind of uh, factor are sanctions and the strength and likelihood of sanctions. Now, according to um, Chislagi and Heis, um, the interaction between these four different factors really um, give rise to a spectrum of normative influence, where at one extreme of the spectrum, we have the weakest influence where norms offer an accessible model of behavior. And then to the, to the other extreme, there's the strongest influence where norms define what is obligatory. Now, um, just before stepping into the data and the analysis, I just want to give a, say a few words on the design and the method. Uh, now, this research was designed and conducted adopting a constructivist grounded theory approach. Um, so the data collected in this, um, in this research, research was collected between January and December 2019 in Accra, Ghana's capital. And during that time, I, I, I conducted the, the 45 semi-structured interviews in two separate rounds. Um, in the first round, I used a set of exploratory questions using some of the notions or concepts that emerge that emerge from ethnographies of the Ghana police service or of the state in Ghana has sensitizing concepts. While in the second round of interviews, I used a set of vignettes or you know, very short stories that simulated real life experience. And each of these vignettes um, outlined a hypothetical yet realistic scenario in which compliance with an existing social norm could imply corrupt behavior. So once participants read the stories, then they were asked a set of questions to further involve them in, in creating meaning as well. Now, I interviewed primarily senior police officers in Accra, but also retired officers and bus and taxi drivers in, um, in, in Ghana. Um, before going into the data, just a couple of words on um, of the context of Ghana. Now, despite Ghana's steady democratic rule in the past 25 years, um, the Ghanaian state is considered by some scholars as a neo patrimonial state, so a state where patron client relations, informality, and corruption are deeply interwoven with the structures of a modern state. Um, nonetheless, having said that, you know, the, in the past 15 years, Ghana has embarked on a process of public sector reform that has made Ghana's administrative apparatus essentially compliant with international standards. However, Ghana still scores quite high on a range of corruption perception indicators. And specifically with regards to the police, 50% of the population that has come in contact with the police has had to pay a bribe. And almost 90% of the population thinks that um, some, most, or all policemen in Ghana are corrupt. Now, as I was collecting the data on possible drivers of corruption in the police service, I, I plotted this data in, according to the four different domains I, I presented in the analytical framework. Um, now, what came out of, um, of here was in the material domain, participants flagged 
um, um, low salaries and lack of institutional resources as, as highly problematic. But they also indicated that, you know, they did come into access of gifts or illicit cash uh, and so on, and how often um, this, these bribes on this cash would flow, would flow upwards in the, in, um, in the, in the police service. In the social domain, um, research participants flagged, you know, the access to uh, extended family networks, the strong um, social um, social networks, both within and beyond the service, and also the strong line of command within the service that regulates many of the social relations. Um, at the individual, in the individual domain, um, research participants um, um, definitely flagged some some, let's say, virtuous concept or notions, such as the idea of professionalism, of policing as a public service, but then there were also like some less virtuous concepts, such as, you know, corruption as a foreign concept that doesn't belong to, um, to Ghana. And in the structural domain, domain which is, uh, contains, you know, the overall institutional architecture of, um, of the Ghana Police Service and its relationship with the other branches. Now, this structural domain is particularly relevant um, for, for the purposes of this paper. And as I was analyzing this, um, um, the, the overall, let's say, uh, framework, the legal framework, four kind of weaknesses or four kind of shortcomings emerged out of it. Um, and these four shortcomings really act as some kind of enablers for social norms. Now, the first one is the complete command and control of the executive and of the presidency over the police service and, on, and over the, the inspector general of the police that heads um, the, the Ghana police service. And a testament of this control is the common practice whereby the beginning of any new presidency is always marked by the compulsory retirement of the inspector general of police. Um, a second kind of weakness or shortcoming is the failure within the standard operating procedures and the legal framework of the Ghana Police Service to set clear and positive guidelines in terms of police conduct and behavior and, and, and corruption. Um, a third shortcoming is that the internal penalties to, um, for misconduct or corruption, which include, you know, caution, admonition, removal, dismissal, really sit at the discretion of the President of the Republic and of the Police Council. And in some cases, it can be delegated to the AGP, which, however, leads to significant political interference in police duties. Um, the fourth kind of weakness or shortcoming really has got to do with um, the, 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 the procedure followed to investigate and, pr and prosecute police corruption, which opens up a lot of um, conflict events of interest since it's officers of the criminal investigation department that have to investigate their own peers. Now, these shortcomings in, in many ways not only play the service in the unpredictable playing field of political parties, but um, they also act as key enabling conditions for social norms to act as a determinant of behavior. After all, if political forces or political parties can alter, change, or ignore the legal and operational framework guiding the action of police officers, what other options do police officers have other than following established informal norms and practices? But, but what are these practices? I mean, what are these norms? So this is what I call the, the constellation of social norms, and these can be divided into kind of three groups. So we have a, a descriptive norm of corruption, then we have a set of injunctive norms that belong to the broader social and political and cultural fabric, and then we have a set of injunctive norms that are intrinsically linked to the functions and nature of policing. Now, of all the norms emerging from the data, left. okay, yep. The, the only proximal norm, I mean, that is um, the only kind of norm overlapping with behavior is the descriptive norm of corruption. So this is often articulated by police officers as corruption as the norm, as an, as an everyday affair. And um, research participants also signaled how often, as I said before, the, the money collected through corrupt transactions flows upwards in the chain of command. 
And this is a quite significant detail since it sheds light on the likelihood and the strength of negative sanctions in place for any officer that does not comply. Now, um, negative sanctions um, that, are, that are listed here um, in, range from, you know, uh, formal procedures such as transfers and limited career progression to being branded as recalcitrant, insubordinate, or, or even a fool in some cases. So what emerges from, uh, from this account is that police, cor police corruption in this context is a highly interdependent and detectable behavior within the service with strong and likely sanctions regulated by a direct descriptive norm. So in other words, the descriptive norm of corruption appears to define what is appropriate or in some circumstances, even obligatory behavior for police officers. Now, um, if we look at the injunctive norms that belong to kind of the broader social um, uh, and political fabric, um, uh, we have a set of kind of indirect norms that can be grouped in two, uh, in two groups. On, on here on the left, we have a set of norms that really revolve around the notions of status, of authority, of wealth, while here on the right, we have a set of norms that really revolve around um, issues of um, around notions of reciprocity and respecting family uh, responsibilities. Now, in, in general, across all these norms, we have um, a set of, of positive sanctions that really are about acquiring status, acquiring social capital, and entering in other people's solidarity networks. While the negative sanction is always about being branded as, um, as a failure or um, being isolated uh, both within the service or with the extended family, which is incredibly problematic for many officers, especially when they hit um, the retirement age. Now, um, what we can um, glean from, from these norms is that um, and if we look at them through the spectrum of normative influence, it's that we see a set of indirect norms sustaining a detectable and inter inter interdependent behavior among police officers with likely and strong sanctions in place. So this seems to suggest that this specific group of norms, uh, unlike the descriptive norm for corruption, seem to define what is accepted or at least tolerated within the Ghana police service, and therefore offering a model of behavior for officers. Finally, um, we have a, a set of injunctive norms here that are intrinsically linked to the, to the functions and nature of policing. And some of these notions, some of these norms are, um, are really about predatory authority and about making profits for yourself. Um, and, um, and, and again, while these two sets of norms seem to suggest that um, these, um, these norms give a, a model of behavior, the same cannot be said for respecting of the, li the line of command, which is something that research participants flag as something unquestionable within the service. So in many ways, um, this suggests that um, is, um, this seems to suggest to define what is obligatory really for, for police officers. So to conclude, because I'm aware of the strict timekeeping today, um, what are the, the implications? Well, I think that what emerges from this analysis um, really echoes what some recent literature in the study of corruption has emphasized regarding the need to understand corruption as a social practice or institution and not just the sum of individual corrupt acts. So it's not my contention to say that social norms can solve all the many unanswered questions about corruption, but understanding the influence they have in specific contexts can provide invaluable insights to further define different forms of corruption. And this is not to say that formal rules or institutions or laws are not important, but what this research illustrates is that they're not enough. Um, a second contribution is theoretical in nature. Um, I mean, what I was saying at the beginning is that corruption has been, um, the study of corruption has been haunted by this tension between universalism of rational choice approaches and the relativism of anthropological studies. So I think that social norms really can mediate um, between these two, within this tension, and, um, um, and, can, and can really help in unpacking loaded and contested concepts such as culture, such as informality, such as neo-patrimonialism within the context of the African state. 
Um, a third contribution is empirical. I think that understanding the social dimension of corruption is really critical to devising effective anti-corruption campaigns and reforms. And lastly, the fourth contribution is about um, really methodological, um, since there's very few studies that use grounded theory to analyze corruption, and I think that this study illustrates that actually um, grounded theory can be a very useful tool to analyze corruption. Um, so I'll conclude here. Thank you very much, and I look forward to comments on any questions. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Um, I would like to ask now Tim to step in and to uh, discuss the, the paper. Thank you very much, Tim. Thanks a lot. You can see my screen there, can you? I, I presume you can. Cool. Uh, so... Uh, if you want to enlarge it, it's, it's even better. Yeah, it's cool, man. Okay, so uh, just a brief about what the paper, what the paper I read uh, does. Uh, uh, Leska Ricardi did say it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a rough draft, and uh, and so there, there are some comments I've got which which would uh, which hopefully would would I think help help structure of the paper. This is going to be a paper, I think. Uh, so the paper discusses social norms uh, and uh, essentially, you know, puts forward the argument that. The kind of social norms could be a different way of approaching corruption, which is, uh, you know, anything slightly different is always good, I think, to, to do this. Uh, there's a detailed discussion about how the disciplines have tried to do this and perhaps failed. Uh, and the method used, which we'll, I'll probably come back to, is method discussed, well, mentioned in the paper and, and uh, Ricardo mentioned it here as well. There's the semi-structured interviews and the, there's also some vignettes as well. And overall, I think as, as Ricardo concluded there, there's findings of descriptive norms, inju injunctive norms, and and, uh, and, and other, other norms as well. So, uh, so that that's basically what the paper paper does. A general point uh, would be there's probably too much in the paper. So that would be my general, my first general point. I think the I think the the critical critical discussion about how corruptions tried to be measured or modelled before. I think it's probably a whole paper in itself. I think, uh, and uh, and so uh, that that would be that would be my take. I think so. Uh, and for a paper, I'd get to the bots of papers trying to do using social norms uh, uh, models. You're you're using that as a kind of framework, really a template, really, and saying right, let's hang, let's do these interviews, let's uh, figure out, you know, what you know whether whether this kind of model works, I suppose, really, and uh, find evidence for that. So that's the, uh, the the first kind of general point. So critical points. Uh, I think you mentioned this towards the end. You're not saying that this is in any way a, norm, a norms-based uh, approach is anyway better, superior necessarily, but it adds it, it, but it adds something to the the general understanding of corruption. And you mentioned there you're not dismissing institutional quality, for example, as as, as being as not being important. Uh, but I would I, I would say that it would be interesting knowing Ghana whether 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 general trust in institutions is pretty low. It's obviously very low for police, but I suspect it's probably low across the entire board. And uh, and I think that that's prob that's probably something to to have a look at. I think that would frame police corruption in possibly a more realistic way if, if Ghanaians think. The government's corrupt, and uh, various various other public officials are corrupt. Then I think you'd have a kind of possibly a, a, a better way of getting in. But probably not a critical point. But uh, I'm a kind of oh oh I kind of I kind of trained as a neoclassical economist, so I can't really get away that much from Gary Becker ever. And uh, so the, uh, you'll be aware of his crime and punishment paper from the early seventies. You should probably read it only, only because it's it's pretty dry utility maximization and that's it uh but he does talk about all the things you're talking about in terms of probability of being you know things like probability of being caught uh uh kind of if you are caught what sanctions you're going to get these are all things that you discuss in your paper generally anyway they, they appear there so you should probably have a bit of a a bit a, a bit of a bit of a, a look at that uh as i was looking at the paper as well uh from this perspective as well, you, you talk about distill norms and how they may this the, the may impact on police corruption, and that. So the distill norms and this the, these injunctive norms uh, that you, that you talk about 
it smacked, it smacked a little bit of asking a question whether uh, police officers, whether they have a lot of, ch whether they're persuaded by their family members to become police officers. And, uh, and so that reminds me of kind of the, the not very new, new economics of lay migration, which talks not just about the individual migrant, but talks about the, the household of the migrant and that being a, a, a way of thinking about the decision to migrate or not. In this case, would be a decision about becoming a police officer or not, and ultimately whether you're corrupt or not. So you can look at that also from a kind of selection effect as well, which is a more a kind of more kind of boring way to think about it. But uh, I, I think I think there might be I think that would be interesting to to at least think about. That brings me on to the third point, which is it, it's not clear, uh, you know, why people would join the police force in Ghana. You talk about wages are pretty low. But compared to other public officials, they're high. It would again. It would be quite nice to know uh, a little bit more about what you need, what education you need, qualifications you need to become a police officer, uh, and can the hiring of officers be corrupt? So nepotism. Is your family members are there different generations of police officers and and uh, and the like? And I think there you you get into what I would call you know within group dynamics really and about whether these things are inherited uh, and there are there is some literature looks at that uh, at corruption in the in, in other fields uh, you also mentioned the paper we didn't mention you in your in your in, in your presentation they didn't have time to look about officers you've talked about officers being either members of two political parties uh, I mean that for me would be I would think that would create some kind of turf war right I mean that would be my 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 prediction would be like, well, they shop each other in. Uh, if you know this guy gets in, well, he's not my political party. Or get rid of him, well, I'll shop. So it, 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 th those kinds of things, I think, uh, are, are interesting to perhaps think about, and whether officers would would hedge their bets and be members of both political parties. Uh, so I think some understanding of within group dynamics, again, as I mentioned, would would be good. But what's being said in the paper, it would seem the gun aim police force is most similar. I mean, to an organised crime outfit. And therefore, I mean, in, in terms of the hierarchy of it, and you talk about, in sec part five here talks about, uh, well, you talk about people bribing and, and then it, I, I'm not sure if, you know, a policeman's bribed and they take a cut and then the senior officer takes a cut and, and so on and so on. In which case, that, 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 that sounds just like a, an organised crime organisation to me. So I would have thought looking at that literature would be, which you may have done already. I mean, I would have, I would have thought you might be able to get some, uh, some, uh, some bits of information from there. Uh, yeah, point five is uh, about again average pay of police officers. At some point, at some point, in the paper I, I ask you this specifically and uh, answer it when when we get around to it. But uh, you say that the Ghanaian police force were given a pay rise. And then on the back of that, bribery went up. And then you say, well, it's because there's because perhaps penalties weren't enforced and other sanctions weren't there. Uh, but that in itself is an intriguing thing to try and try and explain. Uh, I don't know how long I've got, Randall. Uh, I can I, what one, one minute? minute. One minute. One minute. Okay, cool, man. Cool, man. So they're my they're my critical points. There were a few semi semi critical points. I mean, I for me, I was really looking forward to seeing the vignettes you've asked. And uh, they're not there, you know. I'm like, well, I love vignettes; they're really good. You can get into them because because it's it's because the design of them is really important, right? I mean, you you know, and and, and because yeah, they, they are they are they are tricky to get right. So it's like well interesting looking at. So I, I like. I mean, I've never used them, but I get students students of mine and project students of mine to, you know, to definitely look at them because they're, they're they're just an interesting thing to and and, and something to to create arg argument debate, and it, it's a good thing. Uh, and probably the last thing I'm going to say is, uh, obviously you've got ethical approval to do this because this looks quite frightening to to go out, to go to Accra and say, well, I'm going to ask a load of current police officers about corruption. I mean, I <laughs> you're a braver man than me, but <laughs> the fact you've got ethical approval is <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> But but that's another thing. That's a, that's a you know that's another thing for perhaps pick up in the, in the conversation. I wouldn't do it, but uh, uh, and it's a heck of a thing. There's other minor points, but I'll I think I'll I'll finish there. 
Randolph. I'll finish on, on time, mate. Thank I'll you. Thank you. Sharing my screen. Thank you very much. So we we have uh, listened to three very interesting presentations uh, with three different kind of uh, uh, takes on corruption, and uh, they're really, really uh, 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 connected to each other. So uh, what I would suggest is uh, to uh, ask uh, Luca, Luca Andriani, yep. Yep. to uh, to go yep. through questions uh, from the from the audience because we have quite a few. And yeah, actually, there are quite a few questions. And yeah, yeah. Uh, we start might... with the paper and one, so the paper of uh, uh, of Andrea, and then we go from there. And uh, yep. at the beginning of the reply, Andrea, uh, you can all obviously reply also if you feel like to some, some of my points. But I, I prefer first Luca Andriani to give you a, a, a list of, of questions. So okay. paper one, please, Luca. Okay, first of all, I, I think it would be better to give uh, the voice to the audience directly that they ask the question. So I will just, uh, the, the first one comes from Elodie for, um, for Andrea. Uh, please, Elodie, if you, if you want to ask directly the question to Andrea. Hi. So I'm, I'm, if, if you allow me, I'm also going to ask the question that Julia asked in the chat because Julia left. She yes, to perfect. That's fine. Okay, so, two questions. And, and uh, I think, Andrea, that's a question that uh, Randolph mentioned in his comments as well. So you will be able to answer all of us at once, which is quite cool. Um, so I was just wondering, you say that you're looking at neighboring municipalities. And I was just wondering if you had you know, done anything to try and test how far this neighboring effect was working. So, you know, if you said 10 kilometers, you're detecting an effect. If you take 20 kilometers or, or you know, 30 kilometers, does it, does it change anything? And if I remember correctly, um, Randolph had something along those lines with, you know, does it matter on the size of the city? Does it matter on whether they are, you know, a large city center or just a, a small village? Um, so, so, you know, maybe you want to combine those questions. And, and actually, uh, Julia had uh, a um, similar point. She said it, it was generally very, a good, very interesting to differentiate big cities to smaller municipalities. And she actually gave you a reference in, in, in the chat box if you want to have a look. So, yeah. Yeah, sure. So first of all, thanks a lot. So thanks, Ronald, for a lot for the comments. They are great. I'm going to comment a little bit on that later on, uh, if I can. Uh, to answer to these questions, so first of all, I, I did some robustness check on this on the paper. So I haven't done it. So this is still a working paper. I, before starting some meeting, I would like to do something more on this direction. But so far, I can say that the results apply at least if you go up to the third degree of connection. So if you're looking to the neighboring of the neighbor of the neighbor of the municipal this could be so. That doesn't mean that doesn't say that much in terms of distance, because as you correctly say, we don't really know how large this territory of these municipalities can be on average. So there is some work to do on that direction for sure to clarify a little bit the magnitude of how geographically strong this effect can be. But uh, also to add a little bit on the comment that Randolph had during the presentation, to be honest, I think that this is a research question its own. So um, understanding what type of connection really matters in driving uh, this kind of effect, and therefore who are the ones that are really responding to this is interesting in itself, in my point of view. So it's really geography that matters, there are political connections that matters, it's a business connection that really matters. Mm, that's something that I've been thinking on in a, quite a long time, to be honest. Uh, I have a couple of ideas on how to work on that. Of course, there wouldn't be room for this on this paper. Uh, that's mainly about exploiting the geographical connection. Uh, but I definitely agree with you. There is nothing exactly uh, special about geographical connection that discriminate. This one has the best connection compared to the other one. And I do see this as an open research question and particularly important if you want to understand the overall impact of these policies. Um, so that's for sure, and as well, that applies also to when, whether comparing and considering the impact of big cities, this solution, or small cities, this, this solution, and how the size of the municipalities can play a role in that as well. I definitely agree with you. And uh, yes, I, I don't know if I can comment on the on, on a couple of stuff now or whether i okay can we can we all that uh we, well, it's we... A, it, yeah okay um i have a well actually there is a one participant giovanna rodriguez who asked a question to each of you guys so giovanna i would like to give you the voice for the audience. yeah but she asked the question on the first paper now yeah 
Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, well, I'm just thinking. Uh, like maybe like it's just not about one one paper because I have like joined these these two interesting papers. The That's one fine. about about social normal so, social norms and the other one about the the Andrea papers about the anti corruption agencies. And I'm just thinking about about how these social norms really affects the the quality of, of the anti-corruption laws and how we can integrate this uh, this insights uh, evaluating the performance of the, of the anti-corruption anti-corruption laws i am thinking in the case of latin america maybe at the beginning you you say a comment about the high corruption in italy but maybe we have this perception of high high corruption in in this in in these countries but how of this perception of high corruption maybe is just social norms that are affecting maybe that the corruption law laws have an impact as andrea andrea show us in in his research but how these social norms are affecting the laws and maybe how these these social norms are, affect, are affecting this anti-corruption law in Italy in this case. Maybe how can we incorporate, or maybe how what other variable is missing in this study that is affecting this special anti-corruption law in Italy? That, that is my question about uh, so one. To... Or it's more a general comment that maybe than a question. Absolutely no. That's super interesting. So on my side. Um, I would say that, so first, that is, I'm very happy that I had the chance to present here this paper because, of course, the discussion on corruption is much broader than simply focusing on the effect of policies that fight corruption. And, of course, there are cultural aspects of corruption that are also relevant to take into account in fighting this type of phenomenon. Um, there is something somehow that can always affect the results. And so I agree with you. And more generally, I agree with this type of tendency that the economic literature is having at the moment, that we should really study in detail the context and the institutional context in which each policy is implemented, because you really, the very same policy can really have different effects depending on the place where you are actually implementing it. Um, but at the same time, so you should consider, like, for example, focusing on about my case, the, the effectiveness of this policy has been extremely criticized, uh, not only by researchers, but also from news, from the media, and from policymakers in general. And that's probably due to the Italian context in which the organized crime is really, in a sense, infiltrated into the society, in particular in the public administration side of some areas of the country. So uh, there's been a lot of critique showing that this policy was not really much effective. But on the other hand, uh, I can say that there are like very interesting papers, like for example, the Herats and Finan paper exploring in the uh, Brazilian, um, Brazilian extraction of anti-corruption policies in Brazilian municipalities, showing that instead those policies that were not, seem, not identical, but similar in the scope to mine, they were actually effective in reducing the overall level of corruption. So I would say, Yes, definitely. Uh, the social norms are important. Definitely the contest, I would rephrase social norms like saying the contest in which you implement a policy do matter overall. And therefore, it's a bit complicated to say in every case what would be the impact of an anti-corruption measure in that contest. You should really start talking about it case by case, in my point of view. Thank you, Andrea. Great. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. So, Randolph, we can move then to the second paper, right? Yes, I think so. The paper. Yeah. Look up there. We have also quite interesting questions here. I will start with Milos, if you don't mind, guys, so that he asks a question. Please, Milos. Milos, please. Disappear. Um, you can even read the question, maybe, Luca. Yeah, I'm going to read the question then. So, I'm 54. So 
Mobius was ask you um, to what extent are you relying on the historical index human development index also I'm currently working on PhD thesis investigating historical corruption and I would really like to read your paper and then he gives his mail so but the question is essentially to what extent are you relying on the historical index of human development index Luca Luca Oh, but, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure I understand the question, but yeah, I mean, the answer is I don't know this indicator and I'm not using it in this, in this okay. paper. But uh, the, can, I, um, can I answer some of the other questions that I've tried to bring together? Um, we, okay, yes, we got yeah. other two questions, but okay, fine. Okay, do you want to read them out? Uh, yes, yeah, better if Luca, Luca Andriani read them out and then... Yeah, you... it's better. Okay, so <laughs> actually, yeah. LOD has got one question for you. Yeah. You, can, you can directly... Yes, yeah, sorry for monopolizing the oh, Q&A session. But so, so <clears throat> the, um, Luca, it was just a, a general comment on the VDEM data set because it's, it's based on expert opinion. Uh, how, you know, how... how strongly do you believe in the measure essentially you know and, and yeah. do you think there might be any um, um, maybe endogeneity in the measure uh, based yeah. on uh, the experts beliefs on you know the relationship between growth and uh, corruption or, or um, political uh, institutions and corruption yeah no I mean I think this is really the um, so the crux of the issue and that's why the paper is very much of a data focused paper because I spend a lot of time sort of pondering the pros and cons of this indicator and trying to argue actually that there is some uh, 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 meaningful uh, information in this in this indicator. Um, so the, uh, the, the VDEM data set relies entirely on the perceptions of experts. So it's an, it's a, and the measure that I use is an expert coded measure. Um, so the answer is that it's, it's obviously there's all the usual caveats, uh, all the usual caveats apply. Uh, they always apply when we use perception-based indicators such as Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index, uh, the World Bank's measure, or the even the standards uh, uh, Bayesian uh, measure to answer Giovanna's, uh, uh, Giovanna's question. Uh, obviously one, potential downside of the, of, the, uh, uh, of the VDEM indicator is that it is coded retrospectively rather than, rather than being coded year by year. So there's a time distance between what is being coded and the coder that comes into the picture and is entirely based on the view of experts. Whereas for instance, Transparency International's measure is based on the responses of a range of uh, um, uh, categories of respondents, including business leaders and citizens. Now, of course, the biases inherent in these categories of respondents could cancel each other out, for instance. I mean, you could argue that in the, uh, in the case of the Transparency International Indicator. But another possible argument that you could make is that maybe citizens and business leaders are more biased than academics when it comes to evaluating corruption, possibly because, okay, maybe I have a particularly high-minded view of our profession, but I think it's generally more likely for a business leader or for a citizen, at least in some countries, to have come into contact with corruption themselves, you know, to have engaged in corruption than the average academic. I, I don't know. Uh, so maybe business leaders and citizens know more about corruption than academics because they've experienced it themselves or they're more likely to have experienced it themselves, but they may be more biased. So maybe the, 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 the VDEM indicator is less precise, but actually less systematically biased. Um, in any case, I think it's a valuable addition to other existing indicators purely because it extends the coverage so dramatically, but it shares all of the weaknesses uh, of the, uh, of the uh, existing indicators. And even of more objective measures uh, uh, of, uh, of corruption, such as the ones, such as the ones used by, uh, by Andrea Tulli, I mean, it, it, it's true that the number of renegotiations or the number of contracts broken up into smaller contracts below the threshold may be in, interpreted as evidence of corruption. I mean, it's true, but it's still an interpretation. I mean, it's, a, it's an objective measure. It's not a subjective measure, true, but it's interpreted as a proxy for, uh, for corruption. And um, yeah, so I think 
you know, if we want to do corruption research, we will have to keep working with perception-based indicators, which are imperfect. And I mean, I think it's a, you know, there's, the, there's an adage that the, uh, the English always uh, uh, think that corruption happens beyond the channel. I mean, never on the, on the, in Great Britain, whereas the Italians always think that all of corruption in the world happens on the Italian peninsula. And, uh, the, you know, when you go abroad, uh, which could be in Switzerland, but also in Ghana, everything works better. I mean, so, I mean, there are systematic biases, but it, it's interesting actually that there's quite an emerging literature based on VDEM that uses quite advanced validation techniques to test the validity of these indicators. And the results are really, are really favorable. This will be the last sentence. For instance, there's this interesting study uh, that shows uh, that coder characteristics in the VDEM data set, coder characteristics and coders ideological inclinations, which are measured in the survey, by means of vignettes, are uncorrelated with coder ratings and also with the discrepancy between uh, the VDEM indicator and Transparency International's indicator. Yeah. So that suggests that any difference between VDEM and, Transpar and Transparency International CPI is stochastic rather than systematic. Yeah. So Okay, yeah. perfect. So, and actually, we can also add uh, a comment from <laughs> yeah, there is a comment from the team. Shakespeare said all his plays about corruption abroad, mainly Italy. That's thank you. <laughs> That's... That, that was to get him around he, to put his plays on. He couldn't obviously say it was corrupt in Elizabethan times because he couldn't get the play yes. on. So it's just yes. a classic. You know, everyone did it. The ancient Greeks did it as well. But, <laughs> Good. So, okay. um, shall we move Another to question the... on the, of Paper 2, Luca, as far as... Uh, well, actually, as far as I know, no, because it seems that Luca okay. managed to incorporate also the question yeah. of... Uh, very Japan. efficient. Uh, very thank efficient. you, Luca. It was a very, very good intervention. And um, so, no, so now a question on Paper uh, 3. Uh, Ricardo. I, yes, oh, Ricardo, if you don't mind, I will start uh, with Jeremy, who asking... It was nice to listen to the paper. And it, uh, was, uh, but Jeremy is gone. So Jeremy uh, just said you have to leave. Gone. He says, uh, okay, I just I just uh, read this, uh, this question. It was quite interesting. I was wondering whether social norms are perceived as norms of just as justification. So, <laughs> which, uh, which so, sorry if I interrupt you, Ricardo, it kind yeah. of reinforces as, as well also que the question of LOD. Question of LED. Yeah, so I I wonder. I mean, I think that like the 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 language of social norms is just a way to kind of unpack um, certain certain dynamics, and it's a way it's a lens through which to see certain pressures that police officers or civil servants in general are or uh, feel and that can induce them in, in certain kind of behaviors. I mean, uh, the ultimately, the, 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 one of the biggest unanswered questions is why do certain people um, engage in corrupt transactions and why others don't? So in many ways, I think that social norms shed some light on that, on what are those forces and tensions um, at, um, at play. And, and while I, I think that, you know, with regards to the, um, the widespread kind of belief that everybody engages in corruption can have a, um, a direct um, kind of link and people justify their, their actions through saying, oh, well, everybody does it and if I don't do it, I'm a fool. And I think that the, the more the, the other injunctive norms, so what people approve or disapprove of are actually something a bit more um, articulate, so to, think, so to speak, that are not only justifications, but actually um, give us some insight into certain dynamics that maybe are not considered uh, during processes of institutional reforms or, or anti-corruption intervention. So um, I think that, you know, definitely for, for the individual, it's, in, it's, it's justification. One justifies one, one's behavior like this, but from a research and academic point of view, I think that it, it can help us uh, uncover certain, certain things. And uh, thank you. And the second question actually is a fo follow-up question probably is from Elodie. Uh, you. Yes, thank you, Luca. Yes, it's yes. exactly a follow-up question. So, uh, 
so so um, in in experimental economics they've done some uh, experiments where they were trying to evaluate how much the social norms perceived by, pe by people or you know reported by people were aligned with the reality and what happened if you corrected the misperceived social norms so there's a, a paper on um, husband uh, um, you know tolerating sending their wife to work in Saudi Arabia um, and there's also a paper on um, how uh, acceptable is homosexuality in the states uh, you know following a, a moment of change of flow um, and so so if you ask people about their passive social norm their views are often very strongly aligned to what they perceive to be the social norm but then if you provide information about how misplaced or you know uh, the degree of misperception um, then they correct their views quite quickly mm -hmm. so it, on the one hand it does confirm that social norms are very important but it also gives that dimension of misperception and so if you ask people about their social norms maybe you have automatically a self-reinforcing mechanism yes i follow the social norm but actually maybe that's not the most interesting thing to look at uh, maybe yeah. what would be more interesting to look at is what happened if you change that social norm? Do they adjust their behavior? And then in terms of uh, anti-corruption policy, maybe there's more you know, uh, policy relevant implication. Yeah. So two things on that. One is that um, I, I, I agree. And, and that's why methodologically I introduced um, vignettes, even though I didn't, I didn't put them in the paper. I was quite frankly painted by Tim. Um, I'm quite absolutely taken on that. Um, so, you know, the vignettes there are incredibly useful because you present a, um, a story without mentioning social norms, but just giving um, a scenario. So in that sense, you're able to, um, to detect um, the norm and, 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 and make a, a whole set of, uh, of reflections on that. But the other thing is um, that you were... Um, um, that you were mentioning, I think it's incredibly relevant because there's, there's been quite a lot of papers now that are starting to come up on social norms. And one, there's one paper by COVID um, that um, talks about a poster um, in uh, South Africa and the impact this poster has on corruption and the wording of it, how it impacts dramatically. So um, if you say that, um, I don't know, I don't, I don't remember the wording now of, uh, of, uh, in that paper, but basically if you said, you know, Five, you know, six in ten people have refused um, a bribe in this health center in South Africa. That automatically in the, in the experiment lead, shows you that people um, refuse uh, to pay a bribe. Well, if you, if you construct the wording in a different way, so kind of reinforcing that idea that the descriptive norm is prevalent, so uh, make, making people believe that actually corruption is more widespread than it is, then corruption should stop. So I think that um, you know the the kind of next stage, uh, let's say, of, of this research would really be to kind of measure it, um, measure norms in a uh, in a more kind of like quantitative way, and, uh, and 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 introduce some treatment and controls to to have an experimental approach on that because I think that that's where the real kind of um, nitty gritty comes out, so to speak. Thank you, Ricardo. And, and there is a question from Giovanna. Oh, yes, this is just uh, a small question. Is uh, Do you think this this study could be, could, could we have a replication in other countries? I am thinking in the case of Mexico, because here in Mexico, people perceive the police like high corrupted and I think that social norms is important to study that that part here in Mexico at least yeah I mean I think that it's um it's it's highly you know it's highly possible to replicate these kind of studies I mean the uh, a lot of um, the work on social norms and a lot of the literature that I mentioned in my paper um comes from the work that has been done by Chislagi and, and Heiss uh, at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And really that kind of um, framework comes from studying and trying to alter 
health-related behaviors. So they apply that network, that, that framework to, to alter behaviors such as female genital mutilation, gender-based violence, and, uh, and so on. So kind of my PhD um, dissertation is a kind of proof of concept of saying, let's get that framework and apply it to, um, um, to corruption. And, you know, like in the health-related sector, uh, that framework has been used extensively by UNICEF, by uh, and by a range of um, of, uh, of development partners in the, in, in the sector. Um, I don't know if there's more questions or if I can just give a quick answer to to, to Tim on a couple of points. Uh, Randolph, yeah, uh, how many questions are left, uh, Luca? Uh, essentially, you cover we we have covered pretty much all the questions. Okay, so, so, so no, absolutely, Ricardo. So you can you can okay uh, a, a couple of. Three minutes, okay? Yeah. Sure. No, it's going to be very. It's very brief. It's very brief. Um, um, on vignettes, yes, absolutely. You're you're completely right. I mean, all the comments were very very useful. And initially, like my idea was to have a very lean paper with maybe like you know like a subsection of uh, of just a couple of norms, and instead I ended up right putting all of all of them in there. So um, very. Uh, uh, very valid point and also like the one on, on you know of including the vignettes and and maybe exploring how those vignettes were adjusted as the interviews went on and and how which sections were were, were adjusted um the 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 other point about ethical approval um, um <laughs> i did get ethical approval um but um a uh, full disclosure there i was I've been working in Ghana as um, an anti-corruption advisor for a European program since 2016, so I had access already to a set of police officers that um, that enabled me to kind of go there to senior officers and ask a set of questions and and move forward. So in in that sense, it was um, it was privileged uh, privileged access and, um, and and I was somewhat safer. Can I just say it's interesting that having access to, you know, having access as an anti-corruption officer give you better access to people reporting on their corruption activity. That's quite interesting. Well, actually, the thing is that I was there, like a lot of people identified me there as um, a technical advisor for um, 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 a European Union funded program. So I, I embodied cash. In me, you know, like they saw money and resources. So everybody was very willing to talk to me, which was, you know, like a, a great advantage uh, because everybody was very um, straightforward. Did you have to take them out for dinner? <laughs> no, <laughs> not, not to that point, no. Buy them a coat. <laughs> Sorry, I'm <major. laughs> uh, Thank you, Ricardo. So we, we have uh, basically five minutes left. Uh, uh, I will just open uh, the floor to anybody who wants to ask more questions. So uh, maybe uh, the speakers, if they want to step in on a specific points, maybe we, we have addressed and they want to uh, reply. So Luca, Luca, yeah, you want to? Yeah, Luca. Yeah, no, just, I mean, just one, one thing. I just wanted to thank uh, 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 Gygus's for, for your comments. Sorry, I didn't address any of them in my, uh, <laughs> in my, in, uh, in my uh, uh, replies earlier, but some of them very, very useful. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I will definitely send you the full version of the paper once it's all typed up, yeah. Uh, no problem, I, I, I really like it, but uh, the one question is, State capacity negative uh, mm. coefficient. What, what do you think? You're, uh... Yeah. No, I mean, I was also um, uh, struck by that result. Uh, that's on one of the control variables. And yeah, I didn't know exactly how to make sense of it. Um, it's a bit of a red flag. But yeah, I mean, I have no no answers uh, for that. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, maybe actually the, the, the point that, I, uh, that uh, kept me thinking was uh, the one that you made about testing the mechanisms. Uh, so a lot of the debate is about whether corruption affects economic performance by lowering investment uh, or by influencing the level of aggregate efficiency. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, that would be very nice to test. I mean, it's done extensively in the cross-sectional literature, but the point is that we don't have long run time series on gross capital formation going back to the French Revolution. Um, so obviously I could do it on a restricted sample covering maybe 40, 50 years using World Bank data starting in 1970. 
true, but the point, I mean, the whole point of using this data is to exploit the long run slow moving variation. So if we start restricting the sample, even to half a century, as long as we put in the fixed effects, we lose a lot of variation. And in a, in a way, the whole point of the paper is, uh, is gone uh, by then. Yeah. Mm. So that, I mean, I'm grappling with this, uh, with this issue. Um, yeah. But the data is very rich, actually, and uh, it's important. You you mentioned in your paper this uh, ideological inclination, and also this LOD's comment is very relevant. I think about this BDM. I don't know how to uh, how to uh, alleviate this problem, but uh, if you do, then I think this is very great one, great piece. Thank you, Luca. So uh, we are heading to the end. Um, we have a couple of minutes left. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody that uh, we will have uh, uh, a last Friday on the 27th. Uh, so, uh, and this, this will be the final event of, uh, of the uh, series. So please join us for uh, next Friday. And uh, uh, we are... Uh, uh, LOD, myself, Luke, and uh, Gerard, that is now joined. Gerard, you can maybe wave and uh, look your, uh, show your camera. So we are uh, uh, looking forward to seeing you next time. We have a couple of questions about recording. We are working on it, and we are, we are come to email you uh, about how we are going to do that. And uh, so um, I would like to ask, uh, yes, uh, maybe the, the conveners, Luca, LOD, and Gerard, to say something and to close here, so uh, just as a final, as a final. Uh, uh, well, if I, if I if I may intervene, I would like to thank all the presenters and the discussants. They did a very very good job, and this, and particularly also the participants. We are always very interactive, even though we are on a virtual uh, framework and platform. So we are very happy every time of the, how the outcome comes from from this workshop. So thank you so much to everyone. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Gerard, any, any final words? You are muted. Just thank you. Just thank okay. you. And I'm um, really pleased um, with, yeah, sorry for having a meeting before, but yeah. No, no, no. It's Looking forward to next week. Okay, so Elo, you have the last words before uh, Luca will stop the recording. Well, I have nothing to add. Yeah, I think, you know, thank you very much for excellent presentations, excellent comments, a very good discussion also from the audience. And uh, we hope to see some of you again next week and uh, okay. enjoy yeah. the rest of your Friday and a nice weekend ahead. Okay. <laughs> thank you, everybody. It was very nice to see you. And see you on Friday next week. Bye now. Bye-bye.